Hello everyone. My name is Farhad and I am project director in Samvad, which is a USAID supported RMNCH project in India that uses digital technology to bring social and behavioral change communication to communities on issues related to maternal and child health, nutrition, and family planning. I want to welcome you in today's webinar on evidence measurement and analysis of health and nutritional behavior experience from Digital Green implemented Samvad and Upavan projects in India. To present on the topic, we have speakers from Digital Green and London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. My colleague from USAID will share more details about them. I also want to share that a recorded version of this webinar would be available and Digital Green will share a link of the recording after the webinar is over. During the course of the presentation, we would encourage you to post your question in the question answer section you will find on your screen. We will respond to as many questions as possible. Welcome again and to those who are joining now. For the opening comments and introduction of the speaker, may I please invite Mr. S. Vijay Polraj. Vijay is a reproductive health and family planning advisor in USAID India and he has been working there for the past 12 years. Vijay, Vijay is a postgraduate in medical and psychiatric social work from the University of Madras. So welcome again, over to you Vijay. Thank you, thank you Farad. Uh, can you all hear me? I hope I... Yeah, can you all hear me? Yes Vijay. Yeah. Thank you, thank you Farad. So good evening everyone. Um, again, on behalf of USA Digital Green and London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, I uh, extend my warm welcome to you all to participate in this important webinar. Digital Green is one of USA India's strategic partners that helps in achieving our digital strategy. Digital technologies hold immense potential to help men and women live freer and more prosperous lives. USA positions it as a game changer to address development challenges. USAID's digital strategy centers around two objectives. One, improve USAID, USAID development and humanitarian assistance outcomes through the responsible use of digital technology. Strengthen openness, inclusiveness, and security of country digital ecosystem. USAID has invested in several digital technologies and platforms for various development challenges, ranging from point of care diagnostics to chatbots to patient feedback system to PIP software system, teleconsultation solutions to bring about social and behavior change on healthy behaviors. And our investment with Digital Green and Samvad project has been on scaling on innovative digital approach to social and behavior change using a peer mediated community based video approach for accelerating key family planning, maternal and child health, and nutrition behaviors among rural communities. In an effort to scale, sustain, and institutionalize this innovative community based video approach using a low cost digital technology. We always wanted Digital Green to have an efficient and robust project mon monitoring mechanism that measures the effectiveness and the impact of this approach through a robust evidence generation. This has led to a Digital Green's partnership with the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. The London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine and Digital Green has been partnering on evidence measurement and outcome analysis of two USAID funded projects in India, namely Samwad funded by USAID India and Upwen funded by USAID Washington. This project seeks to accelerate health and nutrition behavior among rural communities through Digital Green's community-based video approach. London School has developed and applied research innovations and analyzing outcome assessment and analysis, which can be of immense value for different stakeholders in the sector. Today's webinar will share the processes, research innovations, key lessons, and experiences of London School 
in an in on ground surveys and data analysis of two different approaches applied in project samvad and project utwan without much delay i would like to introduce the speakers of today's webinar but before i do that i would like to ask a question actually we basically wanted to understand our audience of today so the question is which of these describes your current profile i think the question is already projected there i am a public health professional i am a mne professional i am a researcher i am a development aid professional or none of none of the above i think you have some 20 seconds to answer these questions thank you i think well we have a good number of representation here uh we have about 23% who are public health professionals here that is 10 of you all 14% mne professional that is 6 of the audience 14% again researcher there are 6 of them and 40% development aid professional that is 17 of the audience and four none of the above that's about 9% thank you thank you for your response and it's a very good mixed group and i think we will have a very interesting conversation and yeah so i will go for introdu introducing the participants now the first speaker farad farad has already introduced himself to you all he is the project director of samvad project farad is a public health practitioner with over 18 years of work experience in public health programs in india and in other asian countries farad is interested in the rmnch program and use of digital technology He works in Digital Green as Chief of Party in Sambhat Project, which we already mentioned, and holds a master's degree in public health from University of Heidelberg in Germany. The second speaker of the uh, webinar is Ronali. Ronali Pradhan is currently associated with Digital Green as regional head for the Odisha and Jharkhand art operations. She is an agri business management professional, but over the years consistently made efforts to build linkages among agriculture, health, and nutrition as three key pillars of household level food security and economic empowerment. In Digital Green, Ronali leads the Upavan project and is a key member of the Samvad project too. And the third speaker is from London School, Sunita Kadiala. who is an associate professor in nutrition sensitive development at the london school of hygiene and tropical medicine she is a nutritionist with research interests focusing on the intersection between agriculture food system and food security gender and nutrition sunita's expertise spans program design operation re operations research and theory based complex program impact evaluations and innovative methods and metrics in agriculture nutrition research she is the principal investigator of the upavan and co principal investigator of samvad evaluations 
And the fourth speaker is Liz, who's known as Elizabeth Allen, who's a professor of medical statistics at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Liz specializes in the design and analysis of cluster randomized and non-inferiority randomized controlled trials. She's a member of the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine Clinical Trial Unit Management Group. She is a statistical lead on several trials and studies in several countries, including India. Liz's expertise includes the analysis of complex interventions such as Opavan and Samwad. She is a co-principal investigator of Samwad evaluation and the lead statistician of Opavan. And our next speaker is Sanjeev. Sanjeev is associated with Digital Green as Head of Monitoring and Evaluation for Asia. He has over 20 years of experience in monitoring, research and evaluation of health and development programs. Sanjeev holds a doctorate degree in public health from JNU, New Delhi. He has been involved in implementation of Samwad's lean surveys in addition to the monitoring and evaluation of various other programs of Digital Green. I now invite Farad for a brief presentation on introduction to Samvad project. Over to you, Farad. Thank you, Vijay. So, so I'll be speaking uh, primarily about the Samvad project and what we are doing under this project. So under the Samvad project that is operational in six Indian states that are most affected by undernutrition, we are working to improve maternal and child health outcomes by promoting family planning methods and improve nutrition. We do this by using digital platforms and community video approach. We focus the intervention on pregnant women and lactating mothers. The program also works to enhance the skill and knowledge of partner staff to scale up the intervention by institutionalization of community video approach. Next slide, please. So now let me talk more on the community video approach. Under this approach, we engage with the community and identify communication gaps and issues that community faces. And then we conduct a formative research to understand those issues. Based on that, we produce content and put that into a form of a video. We use real people and real stories from the field. We work with the local health system to enhance their capacity for dissemination of these videos using a pocket side projector. We call it Pico projector and run, which runs over a battery. These videos are screened with the pregnant women and lactating women. And the discussion happened uh, through, a uh, through a facilitator who are in most of the cases, frontline workers of the government. We collect field data and monitor the program uh, based upon uh, certain uh, identified parameters in the program. We also advocate with the state partners for the institutionalization of community-based video approach in their regular extension work. Next slide, please. So this slide uh, gives a holistic idea about the Samvad approach that we have adopted. In Samvad approach, the community remains at the center of the intervention, as you can see. And we collect data and feedback from the community that we use to produce local and area specific content. This content is disseminated in the form of a video to um, um, using different ICT platforms that you can see on, on this slide on the uh, right hand side. The frontline workers are engaged in this process for the dis dissemination of these videos. So basically, dig Digital Green helps to increase the demand of the services, which results in the increased referral to the health facilities as people connect with the frontline workers and have discussion on a range of uh, issues and topics. As people demand for the health services, uh, it actually results into delivery of the good quality services. So which, which essentially means as the demand of the services improves, it helps to improve the quality uh, of the service which is delivered by the health system. So can we go to the next slide, please? 
currently we are undertaking several experiment under the samvad project we are using a chatbot to build conversation and automate video dissemination so far by using different modalities under this project we have reached more than 7000 700000 people directly and we are still continuing all those approaches so we learned that uh, people adopt new behavior by observing others follow their behaviors and attitudes and get motivated by the anticipated positive outcomes as a result of practicing those behavior digital green built on these ideas to use community video approach for social and behavior change communication based on its merit to engage community into an experiential learning and appealing them emotionally for a positive behavior change next slide please so before i end my talk with you let me share how we monitor samvad project so we use a tech based solution we called coco which stands for connecting online and connecting offline but there are some challenges associated with this system that we use health and nutrition behavior and practices are difficult to track by using coco as it is very much challenging for us to verify the change that happened over time so to address this challenge we used a survey methodology my colleagues in the upcoming presentations will be talking more on these uh, methodologies so that's all i have to say about uh, the samvad project in this at this point and uh, we'll be sharing more information uh, as to how we conduct uh, um, the survey and what learning we have in this process so i'll end here over to you vijay yeah thank you um, farad basically farad's presentation covered the samvad project which is supported by usaid the project activity and uh, the approach that they have been using the community based uh, video dissemination approach there has been a very good buy in from the state government that we are working in and uh, the state governments are also making effort to institutionalize that within their system and also invest on this approach as they move forward and i thank you that for others i also pointed out the way they are monitoring this pro, uh, program the project uh, you know the 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 lean surveys have really helped us in understanding the impact of the project and how the project can be you know uh, corrected and designed as we move forward thank you so much for that yeah i think you have another question now um which will be projected now yeah so basically we would like to understand what are the key challenges of mne professionals um so please answer your question there's no right and wrong in this it's basically to understand what makes a big challenge in monitoring programs yeah i would encourage everyone to respond i think we have done only 55% of response as of now oh we have done 70% okay we are time up good okay the the large the i mean i think uh, 63% of the audience have mentioned that managing expectation of different stakeholders as the biggest challenge and uh, we have followed by that 37% timeliness related 24% technology related 29% methodology related and 22% stakeholder buy in thank you so much for your responses so we'll move on to the next presentation um i now invite liz and sanjeev this is a presentation again going to be a joint presentation by liz and sanjeev which focuses on sharing the impact and learning on lean survey in samvad project
Liz will start the presentation and then Sanjeev will join for a few of the slides. Liz, over to you. Oh yeah, hi, um, good afternoon everyone. Right, so I think my, my part of this presentation is to talk about the methodology that we used to um, sort of monitor and evaluate the Sambad program. Um, the situation we found ourselves in was that there wasn't really scope to run a sort of large randomized control trial or another type of quasi-experimental study. So we had to have a sort of more, we sort of looked for a more pragmatic approach to monitor, evaluate and learning, uh, for the monitoring and evaluation and learning of SAMVAD. Um, one of the reasons we wanted to do this is, although you'll see from the second half of the presentation this afternoon that, you know, we're very keen on randomised controlled trials, sometimes they can be very expensive and fairly onerous. Um, despite the fact that they are generally viewed as a sort of gold standard and they are robust. What we felt here was that there was an opportunity to apply and evaluate sort of different new innovative methodologies to learn from programmes um, with a double aim, just not, not just evaluating the impact of the programme, but sort of rapidly building the capacity of the organisation in these approaches so that they could actually be sort of embedded into these large scale programmes. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so the objectives of our evaluation on the measurement and learning we were, um, evaluation that we were doing was fourfold. We wanted to understand the reach of the programme and we wanted to understand, so, and with that, not only want to see how many people we've got to, but we wanted to know a little bit about the knowledge and practice, both in maternal and child health practices, appropriate IYCF and hygiene practices, but family planning as well. We needed to assess the knowledge and use of modern contraceptive methods among men and women. Um, oh, sorry, the chat box keeps popping up in my screen. And we also wanted to see how, what the awareness was and how much uptake there was of selected government schemes and entitlements. Next slide, please. So the approach that we have implemented as part of our program here is what we've, we take to, we sort of refer to as lean and frequent surveys. And that means that we've got, instead of having a large survey done before a program is implemented and then another very large survey at the end, without much knowledge of what's going on in the middle, we've done a series of much shorter surveys on a more regular basis. And we're trying to learn from those shorter surveys in the same way that we would learn from a before and after study. The statistical methodology that we've borrowed from in this evaluation is called statistical process control. Um, statistical process control is used for, monitor for the monitoring and evaluation of health programmes. Because what it actually does, and we'll show you some pictures in the next few slides, but you get not just what's going on before and what's going on after, but you get a sort of regular timely update on both the indicators that you're interested in, but also most particularly intervention coverage at the same time. This allows us to assess indicators, the indicators we are interested in longitudinally. So again, we don't just get a measure at the beginning and a measure at the end, but it also allows us to assess coverage longitudinally. It's a very simple analytic approach and has some very clear and easy to understand visual outputs. And actually what it does is there is quite a lot of underlying statistics in there and it sort of harnesses the statistical power of classical significance tests along with a sort of chronological analysis of graphs of summary data as they are produced. Next slide, please. So what did we do? Well, this lean these lean surveys that we carried out were done quarterly in two geographies in Bihar and Jharkhand and biannually in Orissa, Chhattisgarh, Uttarakhand and Assam. The surveys that we carried out were repeat cross-sectional surveys and they were done in each geography. We collected the same assessment indicators in the quarterly and the biannual surveys and we used the same data survey firm and the same data collection methods for each of the cross-sectional surveys at each time point. Next slide, please. 
So what was our sample size? Well, this is sample size per survey in Bihar and in the other states. And Bihar, you'll see, is slightly different because the villages were larger. But we initially thought about how many villages we needed to select. And we selected, in each round, we went to 24 villages in Bihar and 36 villages in the other states. We then, within those villages, we, we sort of randomly selected mothers of children not to 24 months and fathers of children not to 24 months. And the total numbers of mothers we surveyed in each round was 288. And the total number of fathers we surveyed in each round was 288. We also additionally, because of our interest in particular in the family planning aspects, we also surveyed a number of women who, between the ages of 15 and 34, who didn't have children or whose children were greater than two years. And we surveyed 144 of those women in each round. And similarly, we did the same with the men, the spouses of those women. So we've got 144 men in each round, in each state, who were between 15 and 34 without children, less to to 24 months. And then we also surveyed, we had some questions for the Ashers and the Anger Valley workers. And when each village, in each round, we surveyed 24 Ashers in Bihar and 36 in the other states, similarly for the Anger Valley workers. Next slide, please. So in total, you can see that despite the fact we did these sort of smaller and quick surveys. We did have quite a large sample size. So in total, in the six rounds of surveys in all states, we had a total of 7,383 mothers of a child less than two years. We had over 10,000 women of reproductive age. We had 4,100 men of reproductive age, 646 ashers and 647 Anger Valley workers. Next slide, please. So what is the analytic approach? Well, the basis of the analysis that we've carried out are what we call Schuett control charts. And on the right of that slide, you can see a picture of one. And the underlying idea behind this type of analytic approach is that we know, statisticians, people generally, we all know, that there's normal variation. Things change. If you do one round of survey, when you do the next round, it could go up a bit, it could go down a bit. And that doesn't necessarily mean anything has changed, it simply means we've got some variability in our data. And what a control chart does is it puts in an upper and lower limit so that we know that we would expect things to move around up and down between those limits. If something goes outside a limit, then we perhaps believe that something has forced a real change, not just a data, random data collection change. So what do you do for your control chart? Well, you plot the data in time order. So in our case, you'll see we'll come up with some graphs. We started with the first round of surveys, then we had the second round of surveys, then the third and so on. You have a central line, which is your average. Okay, so what your average is of all your data And then, as I said, you have this upper line and your lower line, which is your upper control limit and your lower control limit, which are used to make a decision as to whether the variability you're seeing is just to be expected or whether the variability is perhaps unusual. In the graph on the right, you can see everything is between the red dotted lines. This was a very simple example of a control chart checking the number of red beads that are included in packets of beads being sold in shops. It's all produced by a machine. You don't want to get to a point where you have far too many red beads or not enough red beads, but you don't expect every packet to have exactly the same number of red beads. And that process there wobbles around a bit, as you would expect, but doesn't go outside the limits, which means that we're reasonably happy with the way the machine that is producing those packets of red beads is working. Um, The default upper and lower control limits are three standard errors or three standard deviations of the mean. And one point outside of these does suggest that something is happening that um, we would want to explore. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. So 
what was our interest? As I said right at the beginning, a particular feature of this approach is that we don't want to collect too much information. We don't want fatigue. We don't want people getting bored of, if by chance they're picked up more than once by the random selection of villages or not that enormous survey again. So we had quite a small list of indicators of interest which are listed here. So, you know, we had some MIYCN indicators, so percentage of mothers of children under two who have correct knowledge of MIYCN practices. We, had, we looked at ANC checkups. We looked at IFA consumption. We looked at sort of minimum accept acceptable dietary diversity in women, in the mothers, and also in the children. We looked at exclusive breastfeeding, hand washing, and as I said right at the beginning, we were all also interested in family planning methods. And we also asked some questions around interspousal communication regarding family planning methods. And the final point was the awareness and access of government services, as we asked a question on that. So as I say, a, a fairly wide ranging number of indicators, but we, we very, very deliberately kept it as short as possible to make the questionnaire easy to do. Next slide, please. So what does it look like? What did we find? As you can see here, we've got some graphs. Those are, they are examples of the control charts that I described before for various indicators that we have collected. You can see along the bottom, we have data collection round. As I said, they're plotted, plotted in time order. Obviously the current pandemic meant that our last two rounds, which would have been completed, haven't been completed. So at the moment, as it stands, we have six completed rounds of data collection. And if you look at these graphs, we have, first of all, we've done it by state here. So we have the first example is women exposed to sandbag messages in Bihar. And then the second graph is women exposed to sandbag messages in Jharkhand. And what you can see is, you know, there's no conclusive decision here, but it looks like in Bihar, if we take it as an example, we had the first couple of rounds, we had reasonable coverage, and then there was a drop. And I think probably Sanjeev would be able to tell you why there was a drop, because we did look into that. After that, we could see that there was a consistently increasing pattern in exposure to sandbag messages. And then the last round in December, there was another drop back to sort of closer to where we started. And funnily enough, we observed, uh, observed a very similar pattern in Jharkhand, where you could see the exposure goes up quite a lot by the round in September and drops down again in December. Next slide, please. So this is the same. These are the exposures in Odisha, Chaska and Uttarakhand. As you know there, we only did the biannual surveys. So we've only got three time points. But here you can see that certainly in Odisha, we've got a suggestion that the exposure is going up by the last round of data collection. It's outside the control limits. And similarly in Chaska, you start low, goes up and goes up again. And again in a similar pattern in Utrecht. So there is a suggestion possibly here that we have some evidence that exposure was increasing over the rounds of data collection. Next slide, please. So knowledge, examples of knowledge. This is um, same thing along the sort of x-axis, the horizontal axis is your data collection round. This time we're looking at mothers with correct knowledge of MIYCN practices in Bihar. And that, to be honest, is a good example of variability in our outcome or in the indicator proportions and the coverage of that indicator, which varies as we would expect. So we could probably conclude that certainly in Bihar, there's no obvious impact of Sandbad. However, if you look at Jharkhand, there's a definite pattern there with an increased trend. And certainly by December 2019, your last point is well above the upper control limit. So we would probably conclude there that there has been an impact, impact on that indicator from the intervention. Next slide, please. 
More examples here, we have family planning methods. You can see there in Bihar, a little bit of variability at the beginning, and then a sort of steady increase. So again, we would probably conclude that there was an impact of the intervention on this outcome. And again, a very similar pattern in Jharkhand. A little bit of variability at the beginning, but a clear suggestion that the message is improved, the coverage of knowledge is improving over time. Next slide, please. I think it's probably the last one of results. I've lost track of numbers, but we have min minimum maternal minimum and dietary diversity. And again, this is one where clearly not much is going on in Bihar. You know, you, as we would expect in different rounds of surveys with different women and different villages, you will probably get a different answer to your coverage and knowledge. However, it is moving around, but not outside the control limits. So therefore that's just normal variability. And in Jharkhand, while we, we did observe a sort of unexpected increase by the second round or an increase by the second round, it dropped back down again. So again, I think we would conclude that there was no evidence of an impact on the number of women with min, um, eating minimum dietary diversity. Next slide, please. And similarly here, you can see for the child's minimum acceptable diet in Bihar and Jharkhand, you've got a bit of movement in the sort of estimates, but nothing going outside your control limits. So it suggests it's pretty constant and the intervention isn't impacting on this indicator. Next slide, please. Okay, I think that's, that's it for the methods and the results. Um, and so I think I'm handing over to Sanjay now, Sanjeev now to go on with the lessons we've learned. Uh, thanks, uh, Alice. So, uh, Sambhag, um, lean surveys in Sambhag program have been quite useful. Uh, these uh, lean surveys have helped tracking the program coverage and also to ident and also help identifying regions of lower coverage. For example, in the exposure slides for Bihar and Jharkhand, we saw in the graphs when Liz was presenting that there have been slight decline in the exposure level in the last round. So we came to know that this one of the region of this uh, lower coverage is change in the cadre of FLWs in some of the states, especially in Bihar, and also a long strikes of a long strike for Anganwadi workers in uh, Jharkhand states. So uh, lean surveys help identifying not only the uh, not uh, tracking the coverage, but also identifying lower coverage. These surveys help identify, help understand progression of different indicators at regular time intervals. They have also helped monitoring availability of availability and uptake of services, such as consumption and availability of IFA tablets, ORS, and use of uh, family planning methods, and also take home ration availability with the Anganwadi workers. These surveys have also helped uh, undertake course corrections based on the findings and the emerging data. Uh, they helped reaching to unreached, especially uh, we came to know uh, from the lean surveys, uh, the difficult to reach villages, especially in tribal areas. And we then uh, uh, took efforts to reach to those villages. The Lean Survey also highlighted uh, need of improving convergence between National Health Mission, National Nutrition Mission. Uh, and this convergence was more required, especially in those areas where video disseminations was being done by uh, FLWs of Livelihood Mission. The survey also helped laying greater focus on lesser performing indicators, like um, uh, this, like there was uh, more need of disseminating family planning videos, and especially among men. So accordingly, the program took decision to have a special screening sessions among men for family planning videos. 
The survey also helped strengthening our quality assurance measures and taking more home visits. Uh, we also came to know that there is need of capacity building and undertaking carrying out more refresher trainings of frontline workers. Next slide, please. These surveys, the lean surveys can be more useful if we collect baseline data with having a control or a comparison group. If we collect cost data, we can also come to know the uh, costing of program components. And another very important thing is that we should have a balance between the lean survey objectives and the expectations that we have from the lean survey. So it is important that we keep the lean survey lean. Thanks. Next slide, please. So what are the lessons of uh, lean surveys? Lean surveys with statistical process control methodology can serve as a good tool for continuous program surveillance. And also they can help assess the program impact. These lean surveys are helpful to track lesser tangible outcomes like knowledge and practices of health, nutrition, family planning behaviors, which are usually difficult, very difficult to track through regular MIS. And these are the surveys are good tool for advocacy, as we show in the graphs earlier, that they show progression of outcomes in simple graphical form over different time points. So it is very easy to make the decision makers understand how the outcomes are moving ahead. Lean survey can be adapted to monitor the progress and also to assess the impact of other similar programs. So that's it. Thank you very much. Sorry, my mic is on. Thank you, Liz and Sajim, for your for this wonderful presentation. And uh, yeah, the presentation that uh, Liz and Sanjeev made basically covered how the lean survey was ad adopted in the field, and uh, we had definitely seen very good learnings on the lean survey. And we were also able to see the trend in the uh, uh, knowledge adoption and the uh, knowledge acquisition and adoption of behaviors and things like that. So thank you so much for this wonderful presentation. And I think there was some questions in the question um, answer box. Um, do uh, Sanjeev and Liz, can we address these questions now? A bit of it. Uh, maybe quickly for a minute we can look at that. Um, I think there was a question initially. There was a question about uh, how we can embed this uh, embed uh, this approach, uh, the, the uh, survey in the government uh, program. And uh, Farah that already responded to saying that it this does not require government taking away uh, taking over these uh, surveys. It's basically the, the idea is that we want to understand the impact of this approach and how it, uh, to generate an evidence. To, to build an evidence to help government to make investments on this and also to institutionalize this approach. And that's the purpose of this uh, survey that we've been doing. And I think uh, um, government need, can do their own uh, ongoing monitoring of the program while they uh, start institutionalizing this. And uh, there was a question, uh, how do we distinguish between exposure to Samvad message versus to exposure to message being delivered through other government platforms like uh, Anganwadi workers or Asha's. Um, Liz or Sanjeev, do you want to answer this question? Uh, I, uh, Sanjeev, uh, yes, I, yeah. Uh, Liz, can you, can you please, or Okay, well, I'll do my best. Um, I don't know the details of the absolute exact questions we asked in the survey, but I do know that we have broken it down. I think what was presented here was exposure to all messages, but in we have a load of sub-analysis that we've done based on responses to questions, which specifically ask what, where and how did you receive the message? But a lot of what we can do depends on the questions we're asking in yeah. the survey. 
exactly that is actually the source of information from from the beneficiaries are uh, collected and that is the uh, way which we know whether it is through the uh, uh, community based video approach or through other uh, sources that they are receiving this information thanks liz for yeah. that answer um, also there was a question about high fee tablet tablet consumption 100 or 180 tablets i think government is emphasizing on 180 tablets now earlier it used to be 100 now it has become 180 uh, i think we address all of these question thanks so much for liz and sanjeev for your presentation and also answering these questions and now we have a question again um so this question again it will be projected to you all um what are your thoughts on the use of mobile phones in health and development projects one it can help in social and behavior change communication it can help in data collection it can help enhance the skill of frontline workers by using micro training modules it can help providing job aids for the frontline workers yeah um shani are you projecting the questions yeah the question is here on your screen what are your thoughts on the use of mobile phones in health and development projects so we have about 50% out now i encourage everyone to answer okay your time up thank you thank you for your answers so i think about for 74% have said it can help in social and behavior change communication example sending information prompts on best practices 60% it can have, uh, of audience have said that it can help in data collection 62% have have said that it can help enhance the skills of frontline workers by using micro training modules and 38% have said it can help providing job aids for the frontline workers thank you thank you for this uh, for your response and now we move to the next presentation so the the next presentation is again a joint presentation by ronali and sunita Uh, on upavan project which was supported by usaid washington along with some other donors which largely focusing on sharing and learning of the randomized control trial in nutrition sensitive agriculture project in the state of odisha yeah ronali can uh, start the presentation and then sunita will present few slides uh yeah thanks vijay uh, hi everyone vijay can you hear me yeah i can hear you okay uh, so hello everyone i am runali pradhan and uh, on behalf of the upavan team i'll be sharing an overview 
of the upavan project uh, rather it is a upavan uh, trial uh, in research language we can call is cluster randomized control trial which we conducted in rural orissa uh, next slide please yeah uh, um, upscaling participatory action and videos for agriculture and nutrition the acronym of upavan uh, upavan yeah we uh, next slide please Uh, so the these are the partners involved in this uh, project london school of hygiene and tropical medicine is the pia or the principal research uh, partner and there are uclt core bharat ekjut digital green spring and jsi all these partners are involved uh, in different capacities with their unique uh, role and responsibilities in this uh, project and below are the colleagues from this uh, organizations who are associated with this project yeah next slide please i also acknowledge uh, the donors uh, because of whom this uh, project uh, became possible yeah next slide Uh, yeah so if we uh, understand uh, upavan uh, in a nutshell um, here we try to study the impact of the three nutrition sensitive agriculture interventions with participatory videos and women's groups meeting uh, on maternal and child nutrition outcomes uh, so it's a complex behavior change intervention but on a simple term Uh, it's a participatory video driven uh, agriculture extension uh, delivered through women's self help groups we uh, believed uh, we considered uh, women's self help groups as our platform because we believe that uh, this can improve relevance timeliness and can prove equity uh, and in the process so we tried to made it more nutrition sensitive and more participatory uh, layering on digital greens video learning platform and exudes uh, participatory learning action cycle uh, next slide please Uh, so these are the four intervention arm uh, each arm consisted of 37 clusters and uh, each cluster uh, consisted of one two three villages so first is the control arm and in the arm one uh, we had like uh, this uh, uh, self help group uh, women they come together twice in a month to see two nutrition sensitive agriculture videos and uh, in arm two Uh, they see one nutrition sensitive agriculture video and one nutrition specific video and in arm 3 uh, these women uh, they come together to see one nutrition sensitive agriculture video and uh, they participate in one pla meeting that is participatory learning and action meeting or a nutrition specific videos which is derived from these meetings uh, so and all these uh, arms uh, all these three arms uh, receive uh, follow up visits by the frontline workers uh, who interacted uh, with the community members uh, they uh, try to reinforce the message uh, which are shown in the video and um, discuss during the meeting yeah next slide please so if we try to understand the upavan intervention design so this is the theory of change uh, i know this looks complex but in simpler term it is a, a project uh, input and output matrix where we try to define the impact pathways uh, very clearly so that it it helped us uh, like uh, throughout the project it uh, it serve as a guiding tool for us uh, so uh, can you click on the slide again yeah so uh, we arrived at this theory of change uh, based on uh, like uh, round of consultation with all the partners uh, then uh, we also try to understand the complex concepts and the pathways so here uh, like uh, we identified uh, pathways like produce food on income reduce workload of pregnant and lactating women and joint decision making um uh, making uh, for the nutritional improvement of this pregnant and lactating women so these are nutrition sensitive aspect of it and for nutrition specific uh, aspect we uh, focused on maternal and child uh, child diet adequacy so uh, based on uh, so these uh, these pathways were arrived uh, also arrived after triangulating with uh, many other uh, uh, documents and tools 
for example, global and local evidence, uh, the informative research, which we conducted at the beginning of the project to understand the local barriers, food taboos, facilitating factors, influencers, enablers. So we did a, a separate exercise for this. Uh, this and also uh, we try to map, map out the feasibility uh, of each of the practices or behavior we'll be promoting under each of these pathways, like based on agro agroecological situation and the supply side. Also, uh, also try to examine and analyze uh, the potential of each of it for their uptake. And local experience was considered the most important in this case, and it was most critical throughout the project. Yeah, next slide, please. Yeah, this is just a glimpse of uh, like how, uh, how we unpack the areas of behavior and how we prioritize those. Because we, when we conducted all these contextual analyses, we came across and came out with uh, multiple behaviors and multiple options. But then we had to pinpoint because uh, we try to identify the behaviors which we need to address to arrive uh, to uh, corresponding to each of the pathways. Like for example, uh, suppose we are in, in this case, we are identifying a behavior, for example, growing Indian spinach. So, is it corresponding to the impact pathway of uh, growing in uh, growing food or it is correspond it corresponds to an income so this kind of analysis we did and for each of the behavior we also also analyze the possible capabilities opportunities and motivation to address all these uh, uh, behaviors because uh, behavior change communication is a complex phenomena and we need to identify uh, the most potential and the most appropriate behavior and the within the limited project uh, period. So uh, this exercise we did uh, once at the beginning of the project, then uh, we did this and we revisited the list of behavior every six months, all the partners coming together, brainstorming, taking community feedback into consideration, their responses, um, uh, their demand for next contents and next meeting into consideration and we arrived at this uh, all these uh, priority uh, behaviors which we tried to disseminate to the communities through the videos and the PLA meetings. Um, yeah, uh, so uh, I pause here and I now request uh, Ms. Sunita Kadiala to talk about next slides. Sunita, over to you. Hi, um, uh, thank you, Ronali, for that. And thank you for uh, Digital Green and USAID for organizing this uh, dissemination event and all the participants who are here today. Uh, on behalf of the Open team, and thankfully I do find uh, our team members, some of our team members uh, here in the participant list. So if you have any questions, as always, I will ask them to answer the questions because I think uh, they have also a lot to contribute and answer um, uh, to, to, to uh, enhance our understanding about how we have achieved what we have achieved and what we learned from it. Um, so with that note, um, I'm Sunita Kadiala, as I was introduced, I'm, I'm with the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, and I will continue the presentation now. Um, could you uh, go on to the next slide? So th first, I'm going to present the Open One Impact Evaluation. As you all know, as Ronali said, this was uh, in, uh, in Kionja district of Orissa, and um, in, in, uh, in four of its blocks that were outlined there in the map. And as uh, you all appreciate, uh, a huge proportion of the population, over 86%, are agrarian and are engaged in agriculture work. In, at, in our baseline, uh, we found some uh, concerns uh, as, again, uh, we are aware of from our baseline as well as from NFHS data that 30% of the women are underweight and um, almost a one in five children uh, under five years of age were wasted. Next slide, please. So the study design is um, in contrast to what uh, Liz had and Sanjeev had presented is, uh, is a cluster randomized control trial. Um, we uh, operated in 148 villages and these villages were randomly allocated. Uh, the ratio of one is to one is to one on um, equally to uh, four arms that Ronali has described. 
and we uh, the allocation was stratified by how far the villages were from the nearest town and also the proportion of scheduled caste and scheduled tribe populations in those villages and again, as is the, usually the case with cluster randomized control trials all women in the village were eligible to participate in their intervention but the uh, impact evaluation, uh, which we call as trial participants, uh, were pregnant women and children under two years, women, women, mothers of children under two years of age and children under two years of age, which we, in a very shorthand way, tend to say the first thousand day women. Next slide, please. So our primary outcomes were children, uh, child minimum dietary diversity, which is uh, now a well recognized and used um, a used indicator, which is the number proportion of children consuming greater than four out of seven food groups in the in the pre previous days, a 24 hour recall. Maternal underweight mean BMI of, um, well, basically it's a maternal BMI, which is a mean BMI of non-pregnant, non-postpartum non women of children uh, aged zero to 23 months of age. Then again, maternal minimum dietary diversity. Here it is a 24 hour recall method as well, which is again, five out of 10 food groups, proportion of mothers consuming five out of 10 food groups. Child wasting, which is proportion of children uh, with weight for age, uh, weight for height, sorry, uh, minus two standard deviations. And uh, as is now the best practice, we have collected a lot of data um, uh, along the impact pathways that Ronali has just described about agriculture production, about expenditures, about uh, women's decision making and empowerment variables, so on and so forth that are listed here. We did repeated cross-sectional surveys, which is uh, in the baseline November 2016 to January 2017. And exactly at around the same time, we, uh, we conducted an end line. So therefore the intervention duration, which is important to note here is about 32 months. So women in these uh, villages and children in these villages received intervention for 32 months in the trial arms. Obviously the control arm did not receive any open one intervention. Um, next slide, please. So the analytical procedures are intent to treat uh, and uh, we compared outcomes at baseline, um, sorry, at end line between all trial arms and the comparison is between intervention arm to control. It is important to notice that when I present results and when I say this is the impact of this arm, this is compared to the control and not between arms themselves because that would have required a huge sample size which means we had to operate in a huge um, area which also required huge budgets um, and and actually capacity yeah and uh, we used uh, GE models to account for clustering we adjusted for baseline measures and for stratification we also conducted a mixed methods process evaluation and economic evaluation which took the which took the um, approach of cost consequence next slide please So the key impact evaluation findings are as follows. What we find is that uh, the, the agriculture arm where women received two videos, uh, women watched and discussed two uh, nutrition sensitive agriculture videos to just to remind you. Um, we do not find an impact of that arm versus the control on children's minimum dietary diversity. But for the other two arms, which is agriculture, the, the, the in arm two, which is the agri where the women watch one nutrition sensitive video and one uh, nutrition specific video per month, um, you see an impact on child uh, minimum dietary diversity, you know, an increase in 19, uh, 19%. And uh, you see uh, also a bigger impact compared to the control when you add PLA to that, which is the ARM3 one. We don't uh, see an impact on maternal BMI um, on this. And um, with respect to min maternal minimum dietary diversity, what we find is that the first ARM, AgriArm, or where women watch two nutrition sensitive agriculture videos, you do find an impact on that and, and also uh, on the ARM3, which included PLA. But it is worth noting as because we were presenting these results and we had a question about uh, the uh, italics um, in terms of marginally significant impact of ARM2 on maternal minimum dietary diversity. And I want to point out here that if you look at 
uh, child minimum dietary diversity and maternal minimum dietary diversity, you find the confidence intervals are quite close, you know, and and also in terms of the 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 numbers on those confidence intervals and so is the impact estimates uh, which is uh, differ only on the second decimal point so this could be a sampling issue it could be a statistics issue but it's worth remembering that you should not write you know we should be careful about not writing this off this seems to be an important uh, finding as well uh, next slide please so what we find here is that we, um, unsurprisingly, we do find children minimum uh, acceptable di diet improving in the arms that have also enabled the improvements of child uh, dietary diversity. And in uh, only in, um, in the first arm, an uh, agri arm, compared to the control, we see women's decision making power with um, with respect to agriculture and health decisions and net value of agriculture production improving in these uh, in the in this arm and we did not find any of the differences in any of the other indicators that we measured uh, between each of the intervention arms on the control next slide please Next is the process evaluation and our objectives of the process evaluation were to really assess the fidelity of interventions implementation, clarify mechanisms behind interventions effects and identify contextual factors associated with the variations in outcomes. Um, next slide, please. And this has, is a mixed methods approach. We have used monitoring data, end line survey data, um, annual reports and review notes, uh, three focus group discussions, 91 individual interviews comprising of 32 family case studies and 17 focus group discussions with SAGs. So this is, be, is a huge undertaking and I will not be able to do justice to all the results of this and hopefully we'll have some other opportunity to engage with the results much more deeply especially with the, um, with the Audrey Prost and uh, Decor and, and the implementing partners who are deeply involved uh, in this process. Um, next slide, please. So what we find is that the intervention was implemented with high fidelity. That means it was uh, implemented as it was planned for the most part. So all the interventions and planned events, by events we mean either a video dissemination or a PLA meeting, happened as planned. And in the last six months of observation of uh, the, the community facilitators who facilitated the videos and the PLA meetings, uh, the, the, the there was a structured observation of the quality of video dissemination and all of them actually receive a grade A. Obviously, this was not always the case. So this comes back to how ongoing program improvements through monitoring systems are important. Uh, so so where where when, when people were, um, you know, do, doing a grade B or not doing so well on certain aspects, even within each of grade A or grade B, they were given um, training, refresher trainings and supportive supervision to, to help improve the quality of the dissemination. And um, we found that about 50% of the mothers were active in the self-help groups. And um, and about uh, fifty percent, over fifty percent, or you know, somewhere between fifty and fifty-eight percent of women went to any Upaman event in the last six months. And uh, between three four point four and three point uh, three uh, uh, dissemination events or number of events were attended in the last six months out of a possible eleven. And these um, these exposure uh, or you know um, indicators are somewhat similar to what you find in uh, in in effective um, effective interventions such as these from what we gather from other studies. Um, next slide, please. So what did we find here? Um, what we found is that you can just click on all the three bullet points or four that are there. Thank you. Um, there were, you know, clearly, although, as Ronali said, we really looked at what are the structural constraints, address those, take those into account and uh, plan accordingly. So we were careful to not promote water intensive, land intensive, for example, agriculture practices. Um, we were careful to promote seasonally appropriate crops. 
so on and so forth. Nevertheless, you do hit a threshold or a ceiling very quickly where you can't overcome any structural, you cannot overcome all structural constraints to add for these families to adopt all agricultural practices that we are promoting without any supply side uh, intervention changes. So just demand driven, um, while as you can see was effective in improving certain things can also be limited in its impact because there might be these kind of structural constraints if not addressed um, through the supply side. Um, therefore, what happened was that though all families were not able to adopt all practices, many families adopted some uh, practices which uh, suited their, uh, their situation. So one of the questions for us is that, is this menu of options, offering a menu of options is a good idea so that, you know, some people can, most people can adopt something as opposed to uh, just a few people adopting uh, very well uh, one big practice. So that's a question that uh, we don't have an answer to, but I think we just need to think through uh, for the follow up interventions and intervention design as well. We also find that greater effects on dietary diversity in the last term that had the uh, PLA component and the some of the uh, process evaluation findings make us believe that it could be because more diverse community members are engaged in those if you any of you have attended the PLA meetings or looked at photos even of these meetings these are in open spaces. Um, and uh, clearly, as in any community, when there is an event going on, people gather. There is no um, room issue, which would be the which is the case. In fact, when people are watching a video, the the, the room has to be dark. It has to be indoors, and and um, and it is a small screen. So there are there might be some participation limits there, but whereas with PLA. Um, there are less so, and therefore that might have complemented the video uh, video dissemination as well. Methods are also based on more active learning, like games and stories, uh, and so on. And there was, and as a part of the process in the PLA, um, if women try to develop collective strategies for action. Um, and and some groups have shown um, like some of these implementing some of these collective strategies. For example, this could be about group members assigning each other to check on more vulnerable households and to handhold them and to and to kind of continue to motivate women to adopt practices that might be beneficial for them. Next slide, please. So now on to the economic evaluation. Uh, what we find here is that clearly staff and joint, uh, you know, recurrent costs, uh, you know, take the bulk of the uh, bulk of uh, uh, the cost, which is unsurprising. What you find is that the NSA activities take about half the budget, but it is not surprising because those are the activities that cr cut across all the three arms, as opposed to let's say PLA, which is in one arm, and nutrition specific activities just in the second arm. So we'll have to. So so this seems to uh, uh, to pan out well. Um, the, uh, this just confirms what we expected to find. Uh, thankfully, next slide, please. But what is interesting is in the next slide. Yeah, is is if you just go back in the interest of time, we are. Um, developing a full cost consequences analysis. Remember, these are th the results I'm presenting here are just the costings. They're not cost consequence. They're not cost effectiveness or anything. This is just purely what did it cost to uh, reach uh, average annual cost per person reached, which are the and annual average annual cost per beneficiary. You see there for average annual cost per person, you just see just five and six and six dollars. And uh, and you see the values for beneficiary reached. Beneficiary reached means just the beneficiary of the trial, which is the um, first thousand of women and children. And the average annual cost per person is the population um, cost per you know the population covered. So um, you see that much to one of the things I want to raise uh, before I may even get questions on. There is this uh, inherent assumption that the PLA tends to be 
very costly, very intensive, resource intensive, so on and so forth. But to me, strangely, it really, not strangely, but thankfully, he doesn't look that bad. If you look at dollar six per population covered, it just seems quite reasonable to invest in something like that um, as well to complement the uh, participatory videos to improve the magnitude of impacts. Next slide, please. So taken together, what we find is that the uh, actually, I, I, to summarize, these interventions seem uh, quite promising. And I think uh, we report some of the largest effect sizes compared to other studies in terms of child minimum dietary diversity uh, as well. And ours is the first to show impacts on maternal dietary diversity. And a child wasting, we haven't improved like many other interventions, unfortunately. OPA1 hasn't resulted in improvement in child wasting. But if you look back to when OPA1 started and all the studies that came after, it's now quite clear that you just can't have impacts just by behavior change communication on wasting because the determinants are so intractable. It requires unquestionably unequivocally uh, investments in both supply and demand driven interventions that cut across intergenerational in, uh, across generations that is starting with the mother or even the adolescent girl very early on. And we have to close the gaps in dietary adequacy. Dietary diversity is, of course, one of the indicators of diet quality, but dietary adequacy in terms of calories remains important, actually, both for mothers and children, which is where you don't see an impact of BMI either. And uh, but there are also other reasons I'm happy to answer in, in Q&A and on why, why we might not have seen results on BMI. And yeah, so dietary adequacy, and of course, all of us are aware of how infections play an important role in, in wasting, and, and we really need to tackle that, not just by telling the mother to go to a healthcare center when the child is sick, but also to really improve healthcare center's performance uh, with the needed resources, training, and everything else. My last slide really talks about uh, so where do we go from here? So I do think from our study, we can um, say that enhancing nutrition sensitivity and enhancing participatory components of agriculture interventions can improve diet quality substantially. And, and their cost, well, I don't know how else to put it. As I said, it's cost effective, but it's not cost uh, effective, but it seems like the costs are comparable. Maybe I need, I need to find some other way of expressing that. Um, uh, and actually, these costs are lower or comparable to other interventions that we also uh, have looked at as a part of this uh, literature review for this. Um, attention to intervention development principles, as uh, all the things that Ronali said, uh, were so important in my in my in our understanding, both from process evaluation and our own engagement with all the partners, Varath, Ekjut, JSI, and Digital Green, um, all, all the implementing partners in terms of attention to intervention development principles, behavior change theory, and attention to delivery are critical. So, and also not a and we also tried and avoided, I would say, a pedagogical approach to knowledge transfer. So we have to focus on women's capacity strengthening and problem solving. And, uh, and we try to do that through uh, videos as well as PLA activities. And uh, one of the things that um, that uh, Ekjut and Varat have really engaged with is ensuring that these strong feedback loops are maintained through the intervention uh, life cycle so that the interventions rem remained participatory and remained demand driven. And um, also, OPA1, I would like to um, focus on the, uh, on the kind of partnerships, I think inclusive and equitable partnerships at all levels. Um, uh, were at the heart of OPA1 and what that meant was we had a shared vision, shared passion and shared understanding of what needs to be done and our approaches. So, and, and also shared problem solving. I think all that enabled to improve fidelity and quality of uh, intervention delivery as well. And finally, I would like to thank all the OPA1 team. Um, and we are very, very grateful for all the community members, especially women and children, but all their families as well, OPA1 and government frontline workers who have supported this intervention through and through. They were some of the most passionate champions, I would say, 
data collection uh, field teams and of course local authorities and needless to say or uh, complex interventions like this attract a lot of attention and also detractors and having local authorities um, you know help with that really uh, was um, we are very appreciative and grateful thank you very much and i'll any questions i'll just ask my team members uh, who are amongst the participants to answer because i've been talking for too long thank you i'm done thank you sunita for your presentation sunita and runali made a wonderful presentation thank you so much um so i think uh, you know like the upavan is a as we all understand from this presentation a nutrition sensitive agriculture extension service of uh, participatory videos uh, it delivered through women's group integrated nutrition specific videos within this service and incorporated a nutrition sensitive participatory learning act, uh, learning and action that's a peerly approach to enhance the participatory component um, and uh, to our knowledge at least Uh, from digital green and uh, london school this study is the first to test different combination of these approaches with four arms um, and this depicts the combination of these intervention components can improve dietary diversity of mothers and children however it was found that there were no effect on maternal and child uh, anthropo uh, anthropometric status um yeah so i i think Compa both these uh, uh, approaches, you know, like the lean survey and the RCT approaches, where we are comparing both those approaches that Digital Green uh, used in their intervention, uh, we were able to see. So the the we were able to see the learnings where the the lean survey we were able to see that the tracking program coverage and identifying. reasons for low coverage was possible uh, understanding the progression of different indicators at regular intervals were made possible through this lean surveys and uh, monitoring availability and uptake of services uh, like consumption of ifa ors and fp methods um, were uh, able to uh, track them and also the uh, it also helped in undertaking course correction based on emerging data that is uh that has been following and uh, similarly under the um upavan project also we were able to see uh the nutrition sensitive and participatory components of agriculture intervention can improve diet quality and it is proved to be cost effective attention to intervention development principle behaviors and uh behaviors change theory and delivery are critical and which focused on uh women's capacity strengthening and problem solving strong feedback loops help the intervention to remain demand driven and relevant and also inclusive equitable partnership at all levels at the heart of upavan project so with this i think we now open the floor for questions uh if any of the audiences have questions maybe we can share uh, the questions on the uh, question answer box or even you can uh, answer these questions i mean uh, uh, ask these questions to the relevant uh, uh, speakers so i think before the audience answers these questions maybe i have to a couple of questions um maybe i meanwhile we can discuss these questions and then if people have questions they can also follow with these questions uh either sunita alis can uh, answer these questions uh so there are strengths and weakness of the two approaches as presented by you all uh, what factors one should keep in consideration while uh, designing evaluation methodology and which approach uh, should be adopted for evaluating different interventions liz may i ask you to go first i would ask, ask her the situation yes. i could do 
me. So she's the right person to answer. Yeah. I, I, it's a difficult question to answer because they are very different. I come from a background where I primarily worked in randomized controlled trials. So I'm very pro randomized controlled trials because they are unbiased and they are the gold standard for asking, answering questions on the impact of an evaluation and intervention. But increasingly over the years, I, come in, I find myself in situations where it really isn't feasible or cost effective to implement a very, very, very large scale trial. And there's also the possibility or a common situation is that the outcomes being measured may not change that much, they may change a bit. And we might be interested in that smaller change, but powering a trial to detect it is almost unfeasible. So I think there is a need for flexibility in approach. And, you know, it's virtually impossible to say when you would do what. But I, I suppose my, my advice would be if you can do a large randomized controlled trial, the size of Upavan, and you can manage the delivery, the monitoring, the evaluation in the process of delivering that trial, it probably is still the strongest and most robust methodology. However, if you are in a situation where doing large scale surveys before or after, or an intervention is being rolled out at different time points, you're in a more pragmatic situation that you aren't, you can't create an artificial comparison group and just have it there and not intervene, then I, I'm very keen on the sort of timely evaluation type approach that we presented in for Sanvad. You know, we, we collect a lot of data on regular intervals in a lot of projects and we don't analyze it properly. So there is a possibility with the sort of first approach we talked about to mix monitoring more closely with evaluation in the way we described it. If you are in a situation where you can't stop and start and run a large trial and that you actually just want to see whether something that you are already implementing is actually working or not. I don't know if that in any way helps, but I can't think of a, a clear, there's no clear right answer at any time, I think. Just to add to that, just one more. So for example, if there are no real answers to whether an intervention model works or the theory behind it, or why should, you know, like in the context of Opa One, there was a real need to understand as closely as we can the cause and effect. Now, therefore, RCT was possible, thankfully, and uh, we did it. But if, say, for example, now the government wants to uh, scale up one of these arms, we have proven in one place that this RCT through that, that if it is delivered well with these, you know, considerations, the potential for impact are high. Therefore, there you might, and, and they want to roll out in, I don't know, 10 states or something like that, an RCT would be just quite difficult. So you might want to consider how you craft a, an evaluation methodology such as the lean surveys with statistical process control in a way that, you know, Liz and Sanjeev described so that you are able to get to ease your program working is a different question from does this intervention model work to get to the impacts that we want, those theoretical impacts that we want. I think, I think those are the two contexts in which you would use RCT for sure in one case and consider lean service with statistical process control in the other, just to add to. Add yeah, to Liz's I, I should say as, as well, in some ways, the advantage or part of the idea of the lean surveys was to sort of have more of a feedback loop, which I think sometimes in some intervention or what large RCTs can, can go missing. I think in Upavan, we had a very strong team on the ground and it was carefully monitored. That isn't always the case. So you do find sometimes that you're actually evaluating something that hasn't really been implemented. And then you've spent a large amount of money doing a huge baseline sort of data collection round. You think things are happening and then they're not happening. Then you evaluate at the end and you say, well, that doesn't work. But you haven't got a joined up picture of what was going on in the middle. And I think what we felt about the lean surveys was that it enabled you to look at coverage simultaneously with the change in indicators, which meant that you could say, well, actually, that, that particular drop in indicator coverage was probably driven by the fact that none of the videos were shown one Christmas or all the, all the dissemination didn't happen. And it gives you a way of looking at the two things more synchronistically, I suppose. 
Thank you. Thank you, Liz and Sunita, uh, for your response to these questions. And I, I think, yeah, it is. It depends on the program and uh, uh, how we use them for what purpose. You know, uh, um, definitely the lean survey is a, a recurrent continu continuous monitoring um, a mechanism through which we were able to uh, uh, look at the impact of the approach, specific approach, and also the project implementation uh, in the field. And of course, RCT has its own advantage uh, where it builds evidences and also provides information on uh, relevant uh, intervention that needs to be scaled. Thank you so much to both of you. And I also have another question. I think uh, this can also be answered by any one of you. Uh, this is more related to our pandemic situation now we are in. Uh, with the current pandemic uh, situation, different programs have different outreach mechanisms. Uh, and each of these has its own data tracking challenges. In such a situation, what mechanism should be adopted for monitoring and evaluation of a nutrition and health intervention? So who do, um, maybe Sunita or Liz, who can, whoever can answer this question will be helpful. I think uh, Sunita probably has a better perspective on this than I do. But I would say that at the moment, certainly from work we're doing at the London School, this is a, a huge area of current research is how do we manage data collection in the current situation? And I think a lot of work is going into sort of telephone data collection versus online data collection. What reach do you get? So um, it's a very interesting question, but I think Sunita is more up to date on that than me. Well, I mean, there is no answer. Everyone is in the same boat. I don't think I have an answer. I mean, the only possible thing we can do now is phone surveys to track and monitor or have, have, sorry, I got a bit distracted with answering a question. So the question is about the, in the COVID situation, what is the best way to monitor and evaluate, right? Right, yeah. Yeah, so yeah, I think everyone is in the same boat. I don't think we have any vignettes of extra <laughs> wisdom there. Uh, as Liz said, um, you know, the entire research world and the programmatic world is uh, at a standstill. So one of the things, uh, one is, of course, the phone surveys, but they themselves come with huge um, uh, question marks in terms of who has the phone, who answers the phone, uh, you know, uh, how do you, uh, how do you uh, overcome the respond, uh, selection bias and respondent bias, so on and so forth. So um, as an extension of Upavan, we are trying to, uh, I can ask Ronali or someone from, um, from also the Samba team, we are trying to um, change our gear to do that though, exactly, and understand some of those operational and implementation questions. So watch the space is all I can say. Not just ours, but also in the larger world of how people are dealing with it. Right, yeah. I think that is, we all are evolving in this situation, I think. All yeah. of us in the development sector and we're finding ways to uh, implement and also uh, monitor uh, programs. So thank you so much uh, to both of you to answer these questions. Uh, I think um, we have some questions on the question and answer box. Uh, should we take that or are there any other questions that the audience have uh, uh, to ask the speakers? I can see a question from Minakshi. Minakshi Jain from Foundation for Research and Health Systems. So her question is, uh, my question is, is there a method by which we can predict the results of interventions such as OPUVAN when they are scaled up? Obviously, the results will not mimic the trial results. They are likely to be lower, but how much? Are you getting the question? Do you want me to repeat? No, I think mean, we've got the yeah. yeah but I'm, I'm looking at Liz and she doesn't know I'm looking at her, but I'm laughing. <laughs> no, I'm, I, I, I don't think there is a way, I'm, I'm afraid. I think every, it is always understood that you get a sort of trial effect. 
that because we spend a lot of time and energy in making sure everything is implemented very thoroughly when you run a trial. But this may be a situation if you sort of extend into the drug trial language where they do phase four trials, which is a sort of evaluating what goes on in scale up, exactly as Sunita said, of you know possibly continuing to monitor, and we are hoping to do some further work with Upavan, I think, but slightly hindered by the pandemic. But, you know, perhaps implementing a light touch, continuous evaluation following on from that to see what happens when you actually release some of the control, I suppose, you have when you're running a trial on what's going on and it becomes more real life. And I, I've done that certainly in, in um, some school-based trials that I've run in the UK. We had a 24-month follow-up which happened at the end of the intervention period. And then we followed up again at 36 months to see whether or not that sort of effect was maintained. So there are ways that you can evaluate it, but I don't think there's any way of predicting it just from your numbers that you get from your evaluation after the implementation. Sunita? I, I totally agree. Uh, you, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. This one question uh, from Lakshmi Durga Chawa on PLA and issues around scaling up. I'm just wondering if my colleagues from uh, Egypt and if even if Varath want to come in after that could um, maybe respond. We did respond on the answer, but I think it's worth uh, a, a discussion because it comes up often. So. Thank you. Uh, I think uh, there is. Are you guys going to respond to that question on PLA? Or uh, we... can you can you do that, please? Can she unmute herself? Okay. I mean, uh, I, I don't know if she's able to unmute herself or not. But I, again, as I was saying, there are questions usually around, um, you know, PLA and we ourselves had Digital Green had lots of questions around is a participatory intervention approach much more uh, like intense approach much more uh, intense and therefore not scalable. And that um, from a from a um, from what you see from a cost point of view, that is not exactly what we found, but also the PLA itself for maternal and child nutrition and ASHAs themselves are now conducting PLAs. And this has been, um, you know, uh, this has been scaled up all through Jharkhand, for example. So while I think it is often said that, you know, there is this worry that that is you know, pervasive, but I'm not sure there is much evidence to show that it is not feasible or it's not scalable at all um yeah i i would i would say that okay i think there is also another i don't know if you answered this question again on pla from lakshmi durga chawa yeah yeah that's the one i'm answered i have answered that yeah and suchitra also has done that. hello hello yeah. hmm. yes please is there a question from suchitra uh no i want to answer i was unable to unmute myself uh, okay, okay. Yeah, I think Sunita has answered uh, the question. And yes, uh, Sunita completely agree every time this uh, question uh, comes up. And I was really happy uh, uh, to hear that you mentioned, because many people have this in mind that PLA is uh, you no know, very intense, very uh, you know, resource intensive. But yeah, thanks to Upavan that uh, uh, $6 is worth investing. And uh, coming to your uh, question, Lakshmi ji, uh, at current situation, PLA is being scaled up all across Jharkhand by frontline workers, uh, especially ASHAs. They are known as Sahyas and ASHA facilitators. And in uh, Madhya Pradesh, uh, uh, through ASHAs and ASHA facilitators, in collaboration with uh, National Health Mission, both in Jharkhand and uh, Madhya Pradesh, and in Rajasthan, through uh, NGO you know, collaboration with uh, IP Global. There also, ASHAs are conducting the meetings. And um, the uh, in uh, Jharkhand, we are also planning for a massive uh, no uh, scale up all across the state on nutrition. Now it's currently on maternal and newborn health. So 
i think training uh, involves simple games you no know, um, uh, group uh, work plays so that they get into like ashas are doing they are so overburdened with the training uh, yeah. if the ashas are able to conduct the meetings and um, in a few uh, maybe few months couple uh, couple of months uh, the results will be published and it's uh, it uh, um, uh, shows promising results so yeah fine thank you hope i answered your question yeah thank you thank you suchitra uh, i think uh, we kind of covered uh, all of the question um yes we did respond to minakshi's question sanjeev uh, sanjay um yeah i think yeah so i think can we move on to the um, next piece of the webinar where we we can invite uh, the country director of digital green uh, krishnan palasana for his closing remarks yeah over to you krishnan for your closing remark thank you so much vijay okay first of all uh, i just want to thank all the participants who logged in lot of people from different uh, uh, organization as well as uh, from different sections of work we had researchers we had uh, program implementers we had many practitioners and i do hope that we uh, you all enjoyed uh, the the discussions as much as i did and uh, i hope that it also gave us a new food for thought and how to take forward some of the uh, knowledge lessons that came out of this interesting uh, two survey methodologies that that we looked up uh, thank you liz thank you sunita uh, you are you are wonderful as ever and uh, you know both of you you not only brought some cutting edge research practices uh, and thought leadership to our program but you have been our uh, guiding forces and uh, and and uh, uh, friends of digital green for such a long time and we value this association value this partnership and value the support that you have been providing us uh, thanks a lot to vijay uh, from usaid vijay uh, no not only that you are a donor but we really do appreciate the flexibility and encouragement that you have been uh, providing us to try new innovations new methods new approaches uh, which uh, not only helps digital green but also i'm sure will help other uh, practitioners other organizations the times to the times to come we value the partnership that we are having and looking forward to strengthen it as as we move forward Uh, farhad ronali and sanjeev my colleagues uh, uh, you are you are brilliant in your presentations gave the right uh, pitch right introduction and also set the tone uh, for for the uh, lovely interactions that we had okay uh, during in, in this uh, uh, webinar uh, we also looked at two distinct uh, research methodologies one on lean survey and other on rct and what are the pros and cons of that the methodologies adopted how it can be applied utilized in different context and what are those lessons and experiences that we learned from these two distinct type of uh, uh, research practices that are fabulous uh, and and i do hope that uh, uh, in, the, in the days to come uh, we will not only fine tune this uh, specifically the 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 lean survey approach that we the innovation that we applied in uh digital green samvad project we continue to fine tune it and make it possible for other organizations also to leverage from the lessons and experience that is experiences that we had on ground okay uh, the, the the quality of questions the number of questions that came out uh, from this discussions were very good and and we are we we are sure that uh, pretty soon we'll be sharing with you all the recorded video of of this webinar and i would also surely uh, advise suggest to the participants to write to digital green team uh, if you have any further questions and we will also respond to you if there are certain unanswered questions which could not be looked into because of the time constraint we will surely get back to you as we move along uh, finally i also want to just thank uh, the, uh, 
those number of colleagues who are behind the scenes who are working tirelessly in the back back room ensuring that the webinar everything the logistics the timing the participation the presentations everything went perfect along the way and thank you so much for uh, 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 digital green team and i really appreciate and feeling proud of that so once again thanks everyone once again wishing you all uh, uh, a good health stay safe take care and we do hope that you enjoyed uh, this session as much as we we all uh, enjoyed from the panelists and presenters have a wonderful evening for those who are in this part of the world and have a great day ahead for for those who are in some other parts of the world take care and bye bye from digital green london school as well as usid thank you thank you, thank you so much everyone yeah Thank you all. Thanks, Sunita. Thanks, everybody. Bye. 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 Bye.